Good morning, here yet again for another lovely session of CENG 3325 Structural Analysis. Today we're going to be looking at some new material, uh, continuing on with our study of trusses, and in particular we're going to be looking at the method of joints. So we have two main ways of solving for the internal forces in, uh, in uh, trusses. In the previous video, we have looked at uh, some truss theory, we've defined what a truss is, we've gone into great depth defining what a truss member is, some of the uh, limitations of trusses, some of the definitions of trusses, uh, truss determinacy and stability, and all of that fun theory. Now let's look at some actual uh, examples and math on how to solve for the internal forces inside uh, trusses. And this will serve as a good introduction to our later exploration of uh, forces in frames. So uh, we again, for trusses, Solving for truss member forces. And we, of course, remember that trusses can hold will, or will hold uh, only one force inside each member. That force will either be, will either be a tension or a compression, um, but, that, but it'll always be axial and uh, of one fixed value along the entire length of the member. So there's going to be two main methods for this. One will have the method of joints. And two, we'll have the method of sections. I'll cover the method of joints in part one of this lecture and the method of sections in part two of this lecture. I'm gonna move through this relatively quickly because this is a review from statics class, but uh, it is good to review uh, as we go through this. Not all, not all students see uh, trusses in great detail during statics, so I do want to make sure to cover it pretty well in structural analysis. If you have me for statics, you definitely will uh, learn it to a great degree, but uh, oh, you never know. Uh, all right, so looking along, uh, method of joints. Uh, let us discuss this. The basic method is as follows. Uh, one, we'll try to find the external reactions if we can. At least for a, a statically determined truss, we'll use this method. Uh, find external reactions for the truss uh, for truss, uh, treating the entire truss as a single rigid body. treating the entire truss as one rigid body. As a single rigid body. All right, two, <clears throat> we will draw an exploded view Uh, and we'll, again, we'll, we've seen, we've already seen a bit of exploded view before, but uh, I can't recall if I've explicitly defined this or mentioned it. An exploded view of the truss, where we separate into uh, members and sections, or basically we're going to cut out each joint, uh, cut out each joint, and look at the forces that go into it. Uh, look at the forces that go into it. And we'll discuss this in detail in the next uh, couple slides. And then three, uh, we want to set up a sum of forces X and a sum of forces Y on each joint. In other words, we'll sum forces in the X and Y direction on each joint. Again, we cannot apply a sum of moments on each joint, as we learned last time. And the reason for that, of course, is because all of the forces are passing directly into the joint. So solving for sum of moments about, uh, about the joint would produce an equation with no variables in it. And then finally, four, we move across the truss. We move across the truss uh, solving for all unknown forces or for whatever forces are desired. Uh, or at least all forces that are asked for, or all desired forces. Uh, 
Next, I want to do a short note on uh, the difference between member forces and joint forces. Or at least the, they're going to be the same, but except, uh, except, uh, essentially what direction they point. Because you know, this, is, this can definitely be a point of uh, contention or something that can be a little confusing to students when they first work with trusses or if they haven't worked with them in a while. So uh, let us look next at member internal for, uh, member versus joint forces. Uh, member versus joint forces, or member forces versus joint forces. Because we're going to be drawing a lot of free body diagrams of joints, uh, we need to make sure that we know what tension and compression look like for a joint. Uh, so consider this for a moment. Imagine you have a truss member, and this truss member passes between a, a set of joints, like this. So we have a truss member that goes between two different joints. Uh, let us separate this out into a free body diagram. And actually, I'm going to draw two free body diagrams uh, to illustrate what both tension and compression look like. So let's separate this out a bit. And uh, maybe I'll call this end A and end B. And I would have member. Maybe this would be member AB. Uh, maybe this would be member a, a, AB. And then I would have joint A and uh, maybe up here, joint B. Then I'm going to draw the same thing again. Again, I'm, I'm, going to do the, I'm going to do this both as tension and compression. So I have the same member AB, but then perhaps, and then again I have joint A and uh, joint B. And again, I have separated this out, uh, not to show that the joints are disconnected, but this is just a separated exploded view. This kind of gives the idea of what, uh, what we're looking at with exploded view, where we start taking things apart and looking at whenever we cut something, what forces are revealed. So I'm going to label this side as tension and this side as compression. So we know logically that if a member, or we know not even logically, but intuitively, we know that if a member is in tension, it's going to have a pulling force applied to either side of it. So I would have FAB here, FAB and FAB. That's how I usually label my truss forces. I use just a force and then a subscript to indicate what uh, joints are involved. Personally, I mean, you can, lab you can label them whatever you want, but personally I find it very useful and convenient just to say, okay, well, um, member A, B, or I, I, so this is going from joint A to joint B, or going between joint A and joint B, and then I will just uh, label, I'll, I'll usually just go to uh, label, uh, put whichever one is first in the alphabet is first. And so, although for joints, for trusses, it really doesn't matter, uh, because, again, we have the same member end force for both of these, because it's a truss member, the force on this end has to equal the force on this end, Later, when we get to uh, more frame uh, internal forces, we'll have members where the forces on both sides are not equal. And so we would have FAB and FBA, and those would not be equal. Okay. But now, let us consider what forces would be applied to the joints. If this is going to be in uh, tension, well, I still believe in the laws of Newton. I still, uh, uh, as long as we still believe in the laws of Newton, as long as we still fear Newton's ghost, uh, we still got to realize that uh, forces are always going to occur in equal and opposite pairs. So if there is an FAB here, there must be an FAB here. And there would have to be an FAB here as well. And this is the source of confusion for students. This is, what some, this is something that always can, uh, so do pay very special attention or very close attention to this, because this is always a source of contention for students when they're first learning the method of joints. Um, because if you think about it, if you're, uh, usually when we draw the, the uh, exploded view of a truss, we don't draw the internal member. We usually just draw only the forces on the joints. And see, when, they, when, when they're drawing a member in tension, uh, or when I draw a member in tension, for example, or sorry, a, a, 
joint attached to ember intention, they'll see a they'll see just the they'll they won't see this part because that's not drawn. Uh, they'll see this force here and they'll see this force here. They'll see two forces pointing toward each other and they'll think, oh, that must be compression. Of course, this is not compression. We have to. This is this is going to be tension. If I draw just this joint, a force going away from that joint is a member in tension. This is the difference between member forces and joint forces. Uh, for a member, forces pulling another side of it means the member is in tension. If you have, but for a joint, uh, forces going away from joint at uh, the joint means members in tension. Forces going into the joint means mem means uh, members in compression. So again, if you have this here, uh, this would be F A B here. Again, this is very intuitive to see, very easy to see on the member, because if I have two forces going into the member, that would be a member in compression. But again, applying uh, equal and opposite laws of Newton, equal and opposite forces, uh, Newton's third law, I would have F A B here and F A B here. So again, uh, to summarize, for uh, members, if the member, if the uh, forces are pulling away from the center of the member, that is tension. And then for uh, joints, forces pulling. Actually, we can see that the same thing kind of applies, though. Things pulling away from centers of mass are represented as uh, tension. So if your force is pulling away from the center of the um, of the joint, that means uh, tension in members. If the forces are pulling away from the center of mass of the members, that means the members are in tension. So that is the basic idea, though. Uh, questions on that? Question. Yes. Like on a, just a simple truss, mm -hmm. like uh, the members that run alongside the pin connections, is that a good rule of thumb to say that that's in tension all those members usually? Okay. And the outside edge is usually in compression. Oh, okay. So this uh, uh, question on uh, cords. Um, let's. Uh, I, I will label that. That would actually be a good uh, way to consider this. I, I'll actually do that in the next slide. That's that's a good. That would be a good discussion. Okay, um, let's discuss cords. This is sort of a truss terminology thing. Uh, truss cords or typical forces in truss cords. I can't decide whether to, to spell that with a CH or a CO, but uh, anyway, truss cords, truss cords, one of those things. Anyway, so the cord of a truss. If you're not familiar, let's, let's draw a large truss out, or a decently large truss. A truss like this. Nice, happy truss. <coughs> We're going to draw trusses, happy trusses. Like happy trees. I hope that I can get my trusses members to line up properly. Something like this. Nice happy truss. Okay. Now, if we consider this for a moment, well, actually, we're definitely going to consider this for a moment because we're going to be talking about moments. Okay, if you apply, if, if this truss is in positive bending, okay, so again, if you remember from uh, earlier discussions, positive bending means bending like this, negative bending means bending like this, basic statics review. Uh, positive bending versus negative bending. So, uh, usually, so uh, trusses here. If you have a truss, uh, at some level, trusses ultimately tend to operate like beams. A truss ultimately kind of operates like a beam. Your center member here, your verticals here, uh, your uh, transverse members here, whatever you want to call them, uh, your members here the, uh, in the web of the truss, or a truss, uh, I often consider a truss as sort of acting like a beam. If you think of something like a W section, think of something like a big W section. How does that work? And I believe we've discussed this before. But if not, you should have seen it at some point. The basic mechanism behind the operation of a W section is that the flanges carry your moment and your web carries your shear. 
and really on, on a large scale in, in terms of global, not in terms of individual forces, but in terms of global behavior, a truss very much acts like a beam. The top cords and the bot, the top cord and the bottom cord. Uh, again, a cord, a, a cord refer, uh, the term cord refers to the line of members along the top and bottom edges of a truss. So we have the top cord and the bottom cord. Um, the top cord generally, uh, so that the cords here um, in trusses, so this would be in beams, and then in trusses, uh, the cords carry your moment, and the interior members carry shear. Interior members carry your shear. Generally, maybe some exceptions, but this is the uh, this is general. Now, so because of that, when your uh, if your member if your truss is in positive bending, and in most cases it is, uh, at least in terms of simple trusses and things like that. If we start adding a cantilever truss, then this wouldn't be the case. Uh, but in most cases, if your sh if your um, if your truss is a nice simply supported truss in positive bending, in many common cases. i.e. a simply supported truss in positive bending, a simply supported positive bending, uh, the top cord will carry tension, or sorry, the top cord will carry compression, and the bottom cord carries tension. Uh, bottom uh, tension. And the reason for that is fairly simple to see. If I have, imagine I apply a very large load to the center of this thing. I put a great big P on the top of this, big, great big point load. Well, what's going to happen? All things deform under, under load, and this thing is going to have a deformed shape. The bottom cord will want to bend down like this. It'll enter, enter positive curvature. And so if you think about this, the only way for that to happen is if these members here stretch. Now, it's not going to actually literally bend that much. It wouldn't bend that much without failure. But uh, even on, it, this is exaggerated deformation, of course. But uh, as it bends down, the only way that can happen is if the, if the bottom members get longer and they go into compression, or sorry, and they go into tension. And the only way they, that the, the only way this thing can also bend like this when this thing bends down, these upper members are going to end up all kind of squished together. And so what that means is these things are going to be in compression. The upper cord, the upper members are going to be in compression. They're going to get shorter. Uh, so they're going to have, uh, so in terms of signs, the bottom members will have uh, positive forces because we consider tension positive. The upper members will have uh, negative forces because we define negative axial force as, ten as uh, compression. Now there, would, there can, of course, be exceptions to this. Let's discuss exceptions to this. Uh, two major exceptions. So again, if you have a nice simple truss that's uh, a truss that's simply supported with a with a say a downward load on it, then then you end up will end up with that kind of behavior. But you you can have a few exceptions. Let's discuss a few. You could have an upward load for some reason. If you have vertically upward loads or upward vertical loads, I'm not sure why you would have that, but you could for some reason. That'd be a very odd uh, force to have on a big bridge truss, but um, I guess a br I guess a, a, a tall ship could bump into it or something like that. But uh, hopefully that doesn't happen to your bridge, but uh, it, it may. So maybe that's one of your design cases. Uh, of course, if you have a truss like this, something like this, if you have, uh, maybe this is simply supported as well. Actually, I don't like how that's drawn. I should probably just, I shouldn't have the double circles on there. I should just put a pin here, a roller there, and a pin there. Anyway, if I apply an upward force to this, 
Now these members are going to are going to want to stretch out, and these members are going to end up uh, compressed together. So in this case, the top chord would be in tension, and the bottom chord would be in compression. This would be negative bending. I would have a deflected shape like this. Uh, another case, that's kind of a rare case, that's the exact opposite of the previous one, that really doesn't happen. But what does happen, or what can happen, very, fairly common, is cantilevers. Cantilevers. So if I have a cantilevered truss, and this is a good intro to our discussion uh, later on deflected shapes, so we'll be looking at that later. So imagine you have a cantilever truss like this. Uh, something kind of like this, perhaps, here. Still simply supported, but maybe perhaps something like this. And still a simple truss, but we have one end uh, hanging out, flapping in the wind. And that would be supported here and here. So if I apply, what happens if I apply a load to this? If I apply a large point load here, the curvature, the, ten the tendency for the, the, the curvature for this thing is going to want to go, uh, well, it's going to want to droop down like this. So that means uh, here at least, I'm going to end up with, t I'm going to tend to end up with uh, tension along the uh, top cord and compression along the bottom cord. So again, negative bending. And then I can also have a continuous span. This wouldn't be simply supported, but I could have some sort of continuous span. Let me keep up with my color scheme. Uh, I could have a continuous span. And what I, uh, and for a beam, or in turn a truss, that has a continuous span, what this means is one that continues through many uh, supports without stopping. Without the uh, without the members breaking, or whether without, uh, for example, if I just had a series of pillars, a continuous. If, for example, if I had a, a series of bridge piers like this, and I just connected up uh, one beam here and another beam here without them being joined together, that is not a continuous span. That's just. Uh, multiple independent simple spans sitting next to each other. But if they're actually joined together, fused together, cast together, whatever, um, but with one big beam passing across the pier, that is a continuous span. And you can have the same thing for large trusses. So large bridge trusses are often continuous spans. So if you have something like that, uh, imagine I draw this out here. And I'm going to skip drawing the pins at the joints, but we can just say all of these our pin joints. Very janky looking truss here. Getting yeah, it seems to be getting smaller, yes. <laughs> uh, anyway, hopefully your trusses are designed better than mine are drawn. Okay, so let's say I have supports. Um, let's say I have supports maybe here, here, and here. Perfectly symmetric, evenly spaced uh, uh, spans here. What happens if I apply a distributed load to only the center span? What happens if I apply a distributed load but to only the center span? I'm kind of squeezing this one down at the bottom of the slide here. So again, I have, yes? Oh, what, huh? Okay, sorry. Um, so again, what's going on here is I have supports at the uh, third points. This is one continuous truss, but I have supports on the third points. Uh, so I have a reaction here, a reaction here, a reaction here, and a reaction here. But what's going to happen to the curvature? Well, if I consider the curvature, uh, directly below, I am going to get some sort of positive curvature. But the only way this can be maintained is if the other two go into negative curvature. So I'm going to have basically positive bending here and negative bending here and here. So 
Um, there may be exceptions to this, and I'm talking in very general terms. In the middle, you would tend to have the top chords being in compression and the bottom chords in tension. And then in the, in the edge spans, the top chords would tend to be in tension and the bottom chords in compression. Uh, so, or, uh, and the bottom chords in compression there. But uh, that's maybe going into that in more depth than you uh, were wondering. But uh, anyway, that's the basic idea. So uh, yes, in general, for, <coughs> for most trusses, uh, in most cases that you see, you will have, uh, at least for simple supported things, you know, nice friendly trusses, you will have uh, tension in the bottom chord and compression in the top chord. But as we've seen, there are certainly exceptions to this. OK, so uh, other uh, notes on method of joints, though. Uh, method of joints. Back to this. A few other things. Uh, generally, how I do this, uh, generally assume, now you don't have to, you can eyeball it and guess it, but generally I assume that all trusses, or all uh, member forces, initially that all member forces are tension. All member forces are in tension. That all member forces are in tension. And what then I can do is, or what I can then do is, this makes this very simple. I uh, work through all the equations, all equilibrium equations. And if it comes out negative, I just that just means that member is compression. Nothing wrong with assuming something in the wrong direction. Uh, it just means I have something. I have a member in compression. Uh, that member is in compression. All right, would you like to see an example or two? OK, so let's work through an example uh, using the method of joints. OK, so let's try to actually implement all that stuff. Now that, now that we've spent uh, quite a bit of time just writing on the page, let's see if we can actually look at an example or two of this. OK, so let's work through a method of joints type problem. And I could go and make something too simple by making it symmetric, but let's work through a example here. And uh, always dangerous to do examples on the fly, but that's okay. We'll give it a whirl. Uh, so method of joints example. So let's draw out a truss, and let's find all of our. Uh, we'll find. Uh, I want to lay out a truss. And what I'm going to need is I'm going to need some reactions. I'm going to need some. I'm going to. Oh, I'm going to need some dimensions on this. I'm going to need some loads, and we'll proceed through the problem. So let's say I have a truss, and I'm going to draw a relatively simple truss so we can get through this in a reasonable amount of time. Maybe a five-pin truss here, and maybe I'll make it nice and simply supported like this and like this. And for simplicity's sake, I think I'm going to make this a, oh, uh, maybe I'll make this, let's say, hmm, what do I want to do? Maybe I'll make this, oh, let's do some quick math on here. If that's, I have a certain thing I want to do. Maybe I will make it, I'll make this nine feet high. Uh, nine feet high, you can probably figure out what I'm doing here. Uh, four, uh, let's see, four times two times three. And let's say this is 24 feet long. So totally to scale, if that's right, because that would make this 12 feet from here to here. Yeah, that'll work. 24 feet and 24 feet. And uh, then I'll apply a point load here. 
Can I do that? Can I do that? Can I apply a point load here? Huh? This would be negative bending. No, it wouldn't be negative bending. There would be a problem if I did this. It wouldn't be a true truss anymore. Why? Because the forces are not being applied at the joints, yes. The forces aren't being applied at the joints. Remember, uh, there are going to be pins in each of these joints. So uh, I'm going to apply a load of, let's just say, 10 kips. And I have chosen these dimensions carefully. If you, it's probably scream. Maybe, maybe uh, you can't see it, but uh, it's hopefully pretty obvious that this is a 3, 4, 5 uh, angle truss. So I chose my numbers uh, carefully, or my dimensions carefully, to hopefully give some nice uh, angles here. OK. Now I'm going to get to, I, I want to name some joints. And maybe I'll go ahead and draw the little circles for the joints just to be, oh, complete here. And I'm going to name these things. Oh, let's see. Maybe just to keep it simple, A, B, and C, D, E. Okay. So, uh, and then I, I, I am, so we're given all this. And I want to find, uh, let's just say the force is in all members. So we could draw out a, so let's go ahead and uh, do this. The first step is going to be uh, to find the external reactions. Uh, step one, uh, find all external reactions. And again, I do this by treating the entire truss as a single rigid body. And first, I want to label, I could redraw the entire thing, but I'm going to keep it simple here for sake of time and just put CY, CX, and EY. And EY here. Those are supports and our reaction forces. Okay, so, uh, first of all, by summation of forces, in the x direction, I just have Cx and nothing else. So Cx is equal to zero. No surprise there. Next, I want to get the vertical reactions. Do I want to sum forces in the vertical direction? Do I want to do that? No, do I want to do that? No, I don't want to. Yeah, exactly. I don't want to do that. I want to sum moments because, of course, if I sum forces in the vertical direction, I'm going to end up with two unknowns, and that won't make me happy because I don't feel like solving simultaneous equations today. And even then, I need to do a balance of moments. So I think I'm going to do a sum of moments about point C. That would work out pretty well. Uh, I'll have 10 kips. Of course, I need a negative because it's going to be uh, clockwise about point C times a moment arm length of 12 feet, and then plus uh, EY, positive moment, because uh, counterclockwise. Uh, times a moment arm length of 48 feet. Uh, all of this is equal to zero because this is uh, in equilibrium. And then EY here uh, will equal, that's going to be 10 times 12 over 48. So that would be 2.5 kips. Two and a half kips. Uh, no surprises there. And then I can do a sum of, now I could do a sum of forces in the vertical direction, but I think uh, I, when I like, personally when I do reactions, I like to save that as a check to make sure I got the reactions right, because giving the reactions right really is pretty important. And so I'm then going to do a sum of moments about point E, sum of moments about point E, and I will have CY uh, negative, because negative moment uh, clockwise, times the moment arm length of 48 feet, uh, times, or actually plus, 10 kips times a uh, moment arm length of 36 feet. All of this equals zero. And then, f therefore, CY is equal to 10 uh, times 36 divided by 48, or uh, 10 times 3 over 4, and that will equal 7.5 kips. So no surprise, everything works out. As a check, I can see that the, if I do a sum of forces in the vertical direction, uh, I'll have two upward forces equal to a total of 10 kips and a downward force equal to 10 kips. This thing is in equilibrium about moments, uh, about any point, and in the vertical direction. 
Okay, next I'm going to draw the exploded view. Now, you don't necessarily always need to draw the full exploded view. Uh, I usually don't. I, always, I usually only do it the first time I show a method of joints problem. So I just want to draw the full exploded view of the truss for completion's sake. But usually I just draw out the free body diagrams of one uh, joint at a time. But I think in this case I actually will draw out the full exploded view of this truss. Okay, so let's look at a full truss exploded view. This is a lot easier when you have a whiteboard in front of you because you can reference one on the other. So I'm going to have to uh, forgive me as I dash back and forth between these. So I'm going to draw out a truss exploded view. And I'm going to have these forces here, or these joints first of all. They were A, B at the top, right, and then C, D, yeah. I can, maybe I can do this off of memory, which is never one thing you, want, you don't want to rely on my memory. So anyway, we have A, B, and then C, D, and E. And then the known forces, let me show the known forces on here. I'll have my 10 kip force coming down at A. I will have my 2.5 kip uh, reaction at C and my 7.5 kip reaction at E. Uh, yeah, I, I said, I, I told you you didn't want to rely on my memory. Uh, 2.5 kip reaction at C. Actually, I was seeing if you were paying attention. Did I, get, did I do it again? Yeah. Oh my goodness. Wow, I have really bad memory. Uh, no, I shouldn't call it a day. <laughs> Gotta get through this problem. 2.5 kip uh, reaction here. All right, so then we have FAC here and FAC here. Oh, I also want to, I also like to put my dimensions on here. So we know this was nine feet. And I'm going to go ahead and put the dimensions more like this uh, uh, for ease of reference and ease of finding uh, things and items. So the dimensions on the horizontal dimensions in each of these are 12 feet, 12 feet, 12 feet, 12 feet, and 12 feet, or 12 feet typical. And the slope on this, I'm going to have a, uh, because this is a uh, 12 foot and 9 foot, uh, this is a nice and convenient uh, three, four, five triangle. It's almost like it was chosen deliberately like that. And what a coincidence. Yeah, what a coincidence. It's amazing how that works out. And uh, this is going to be the same for all of these. This is going to be a four, three, five. And uh, when I solve my trusses and things like that, you won't really see me use a sine and a cosine. We don't need to do that. That is redundant. A uh, three, four, five, and a three, four, five, and a three, four, five. So in the forces here, I will have F, C, D, and F, C, D. I will have F, A, D, and F, A, D. I will have FAB, it's a very fabulous force. This one's just a fad. It's never going to take off. And FAB. Puns. Uh, I have FBD uh, and FBD. Actually, let me write this over here. Although, again, usually you don't write out this full exploded view. And then I have FDE, sounds like a federal agency of some sort, FDE, uh, FDE. And then finally FBE and FBE. Lovely, all these forces. So how many do we have? We have, let's see. One, uh, two, three, four, actually, I could probably just count the number of members, that'd be easier. Uh, one, two, three, 
four, five, six, seven, right? Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So we'll have four, uh, so we'll have seven forces. Okay, so we have our exploded view of our truss here. And what I wanna do is I wanna work through a series of free body diagrams uh, showing uh, all of the forces uh, on each joint, which will then allow us to find the internal forces in all of the seven members of this truss. Okay, so what I think I might do is create a summary table that I'll then be able to go back to uh, as we go along. So I'm gonna create a summary table that I will use uh, to sort of record my results here. So I'm gonna have uh, forces here. I'll have the force in kips, this problem in particular in kips. Then, uh, well actually first let me put the member in, that would be more useful there. Member, the force in kips. And then I think I'll have another column for compression and tension, or compression or tension, I should say. And then this will have uh, seven rows for the truss's seven members. So we'll have this one here, this one here, and just right on down the row, right on down the line. One, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. Okay, so I'll have member AC, then I'll have member CD. Actually, maybe I'll just go ahead and fill it in as I go. Okay, so I'm gonna start with uh, joint C here, and that just looks to me like a logical place to start in terms of how I know where to start. Um, <clears throat> really, the only two logical places to start if we're using the method of joints will be joint C and joint E, or joint C or joint E. And the reason for that is that I have, uh, with every other joint, I have more than two unknowns, and that's gonna make it very difficult to solve uh, without you using a whole bunch of simultaneous equations. Now, later we may look at uh, solving using nothing of joints and matrix operations, but for now, let's stick with hand methods. So let us consider joint A and the forces therein. So we have joint A here. Uh, we have joint A and the forces on here are as follows. So what I'm gonna do is I am drawing the individual free body diagrams. Now, truth be told, I usually always draw these. I generally don't actually draw this full exploded view. I'm drawing this just for your own, for uh, uh, completion sake. Complete. I drew this only for completion sake, uh, just to show uh, how it works all together. But, uh, and so you could see the equal and opposite force pairs here. But usually I don't actually go to the trouble of drawing the entire exploded view. But when I am using the method of joints, I generally do uh, draw out each, each joints individual free body diagram. And so the forces on here, I'll have my reaction force of 7.5 kips. Uh, I'll have F, uh, I'll have here uh, F A C and then I will have, uh, let's see, actually no, this isn't joint A, sorry about that, this is joint C. Gotta get my joint labels, right? Uh, that is joint uh, C, and so we'll have FAC here, and then FCD here. Okay, so we'll have that, and let's move along. Now, showing the, uh, I want to show our force triangle here. Uh, so just our little vector direction triangle. This is a three, four, five, and FCD is directly along the horizontal. So the first thing I'm going to do is, uh, maybe I'll go ahead and, um, maybe I'll go ahead and switch colors. F so I'm going to start by doing a sum of forces in the y direction. And why am I doing this? Well, the reason for this is if I do a sum of forces in the horizontal direction, this force and this force will both be present there, or will both have components there, so that'll be two, that'll be two unknowns in one equation. Not that I can't solve simultaneous equations, but it's a pain in the butt, and if I can avoid doing it, I'm going to. Not that it's too bad, but uh, let's just keep things simple for this first example here. So FAC uh, times three over five, and then uh, again FAC, and then to get the horizontal component, I multiply by the ratio of three over five. Uh, if you're not familiar, what, I'm, what this basically here, th what this is basically is just the sine of theta, 
uh, except I'm instead of finding the theta and then uh, then finding taking the sine of it, it's just a lot easier to multiply by the ratio uh, right from the beginning. And then plus 7.5, our reaction force. This must all equal zero for this to be in equilibrium. And if you solve that, you will find that FAC is going to equal to is going to be equal to negative 12.5 kips, or that is 12.5 kips in compression. 12.5 kips in compression. Next, I'm going to do a sum of forces in the x direction, and that would be FCD uh, plus FAC times, uh, that would be times 4 over 5. Times 4 over 5, and all of this is going to be equal to 0. So, therefore, oh, I lost, all right, got a little lost there. Let's go back here. All right, control button got stuck. Okay, there we go. Uh, times 4 over 5 is equal to 0. And so then FCD is equal to uh, negative 0 0.8 or negative 4 fifths times FAC times FAC and then I can put in negative 12.5 here. So this is equal to negative 4 fifths times negative 12.5. And that will come to uh, 10 kips, which is it will be in tension. 10 kips in tension. So that is our final value for FCD. And already we can see what we discussed previously, where the top chord will tend to be in compression and the bottom chord will tend to be in tension for positive bending. Now there may be some exceptions to this if you really load a truss up weirdly, but uh, generally this will be your typical behavior. So FAC here at 12.5 kips in compression and uh, FCD with 10 kips in tension. So I'm gonna go back here and I'm gonna say uh, member AC and member CD. Now it's not always necessary to create one of these tables, but I thought it might be nice. Uh, so this will be 12.5 kips. I just need to write 12.5, I already have my unit designated up there. And CD would be 10. And AC is gonna be in compression and CD in tension. Okay, moving along. I think we'll next look at joint E. Let's next look at joint E. And this is gonna be at the other end of the truss. So let's draw the free body diagram for joint E. So maybe I'll do uh, one free body diagram per page. We've got plenty of slides, no problem. So I'm gonna draw joint E now. And this is gonna be very much a repeat of the previous step. So I'm gonna have, well, not an exact repeat, but a very similar method. Nothing too different here. The loads and the internal forces on this truss are not gonna be symmetric, but the geometry is symmetric. So I have a uh, reaction of 2.5 kips here. And then uh, forces, I have two forces here. I have FBE. at a 345 angle or with a 345 force triangle nothing different there 3 4 and 5 and then i have fde notice again i usually just to go ahead and assume everything initially is in uh, tension even though just looking at this i can i can already off the bat tell that fb is going to be in compression just to balance the vertical if nothing else and that would also balance the horizontal but let's just go ahead and work through this So I'll keep using this orange color scheme, why not? So I'm gonna start by doing the sum of forces in the y direction. I'm doing this first, just like in the previous case, so I can have just one equation with one unknown. So that's going to be FBE times three over five uh, plus two, our 2.5 kip reaction force. All of this will equal zero. And solving for this, uh, I can get that FBE if you solve that equation, you will get that FBE is equal to negative 4.167 kips, uh, which will be in compression. So I could see either report this as negative 4.167 kips, or I could just report it as 4.167 kips in tension. Next, I'm going to get the sum of forces in the x direction. 
and uh, I'll have negative FDE. And notice, when I write my equations, I just go ahead and I always create them based off of my diagram here. Negative FDE minus FBE. So even though I am going to put a negative in here eventually, right now I'm just creating my equation purely off of my diagram. I'm ignoring this. I'll substitute in this negative value in the next step. Uh, negative FBE times 4 over 5 times 4 over 5 uh, here and that shouldn't be any uh, any uh, surprise there and then let's see times BE uh, 4 over 5 and all of this must be equal to 0 and let's see, that should be BE, um, BE here, okay. So negative, working through this, let's see, I lost my tree, uh, cursor there. And so then, um, if I, what I'm going to do next is, I'm going to multiply across by negative 1, because both of these are negative, so it just makes the algebra a little easier. Uh, FDE plus 4 fifths FBE is equal to zero, and then I can put in uh, FDE plus four fifths times uh, my uh, negative 4.167 kips equals zero, and I will find that FDE is equal to 3.33 kips or 3.33 kips, I'll use three decimal places for each of these, which will be in tension. So we have FDE, and we have FBE. So FBE, remember BE, which is this diagonal here, and DE. DE and BE. Uh, BE, well, again, has a force of 4.167. Uh, 167, which is in compression, again, il illustrating the, our pattern of top chords in for positive bending being in compression. And DE uh, will be 3.33 kips in tension, again, illustrating our pattern for posit our typical pattern for positive bending of of tr trusses and potters of the bending of the bottom chord being in tension. Okay, so next I think we'll move on to our next joint, and I think we will use uh, joint A here. We will use joint A here. So I'll go get the free body diagram of joint A and copy it over here. So joint A has a free body diagram like this. I have my 10 kip force, I have FAB going to the left like, th or to, to the right like this, although we know it's probably in compression, so it's probably going to be to the left actually, and then I have FAC from A to C uh, at a 3, 4, 5 triangle, although we know again in reality it goes in the opposite direction because we already solved for that and we found it was compression, so I'm just going to put a little note on my free body diagram. This is negative 12 point, equal to negative 12.5 kips. And then the final force is FAD. And this is also at a 3, 4, 5 triangle, or an angle of a 3, 4, 5 triangle. 3, 4, and 5. So for reasons as we've repeatedly discussed, I'm going to start off with summing forces in the y direction because my current unknowns are this one and this one. And so in this one here, our FAC is not going to have any vertical components. So that's an excellent reason due to the sum of forces in the vertical direction first. Sum of forces in the vertical direction, I will have negative 10 kips uh, minus FAC times 3 over 5 minus FAD also times 3 over 5. Now, to make the math a little bit simpler, I think I'm going to, oh, first all of this, of course, equals 0 it's, because it's an equilibrium. 
Then I think to make the math simpler, I'm going to multiply across by negative 5. So now we'll have 50 plus 3 FAC plus 3 FAD is equal to 0, but of course you can solve this equation any way you like. So this will then equal 50 uh, plus 3 times negative 12.5 plus uh, 3 times FAD equals 0. And if you run through that, you will find that FAD, well, you know what, I have it here, might as well just go ahead and uh, get this. So this will then collapse to, um, this is uh, this is effectively 4 times 12.5, so 4 times 12.5 minus 3 times 12.5 leaves, leaves us with just 12.5 kips plus 3 times FAD is equal to 0, and I can then get that FAD is equal to negative 4.167 kips, uh, which of course is in compression. Again, illustrating our pattern, well actually not illustrating our pattern, this is, a, uh, this is one of our verticals, uh, one of our central numbers, and these can be in both either compression or tension, so that doesn't illustrate our pattern, but FAC uh, if we guess properly, uh, here should be, or sorry, F-A-B, that's a typo there, that should be F-A-B, sorry about that, from A to B. But F-A-D here is indeed in compression. Okay, so next I'm going to find the sum of forces in the horizontal direction, sum of forces in the X direction. I will have negative uh, F-A-C, so let's go ahead and box that. Uh, F, sum of forces in the x direction, I'll have negative FAC times 4 over 5, uh, plus FAD times 4 over 5, plus FAB. And all of this is equal to 0, of course, because it's in equilibrium. Uh, so then I'm going to put in uh, FAC, or uh, FAD here. Well, actually, no, I will put in FAC. Uh, and this is going to be equal to negative uh, 12.5. So I'm going to have negative, negative 12.5 times 4 over 5. And FAD is still unknown. Oh, actually, no, sorry, FAD is the one we had previously. Plus, got to get our term straight, negative 4.167 times 4 over 5, and then plus FAB is equal to 0. And if you multiply this out, you will get that this is equal to 10, and 4 fifths of negative 4.167 is, ne uh, will be minus 3.33, or 3 and a third, plus FAB is equal to 0, and we get that FAB is equal to uh, negative 6.667 uh, kips. And again, illustrating our pattern that the top chord will tend to be in compression, so no surprise there. Negative 6.667 kips, which will be in compression. So let's go back here. Uh, FAD is... Uh, 4.167 kips and in compression, and AB is 6.667, and this is also in compression. And we have only one unknown member force left, and that's member BD. But I will go and do a check after this to make sure our numbers are correct. And this is a good thing to do at the end of uh, solving with the method of joints if you have time. So I have joint B here. I'm going to use joint B for this. Although I really could use any joint, but any joint with, uh, well, I could, not any joint. I suppose I could use uh, B or D. Those are my only really two choices if I'm using member of the method of joints. So the force is on here. I have FAB. which is equal to negative 6.667 kips. I have FBD, 
that is my currently unknown force. And, but we do know that it, its direction at a 3, 4, 5 triangle. And then we have FBE. Also at a 3, 4, 5 triangle. If I can manage to write the letter E properly. Also at a 3, 4, 5 triangle. Like so. But this we already know, and this is equal to negative 4.167 kips here. So maybe I'll do this in orange again, just to be consistent. I'll do the sum of forces in, uh, let's just go ahead and do the sum of forces in the y direction. That would be the simplest way. Let's go ahead and get the sum of forces in the y direction. Uh, I'll have negative FBD times 3 over 5 minus FBE also times 3 over 5 equals 0. Now I can just, uh, because this is uh, set up so simply, I can just cross out the 3 fifths and cross out the negative. And so that will give me FBD plus FBE plus FBE is equal to 0. Or uh, I can then put in my known value uh, of, uh, I know, FBE. So FBD, FBD uh, that would be minus 4.167 kips is equal to 0. Or FBD is equal to 4.167 kips, positive 4.167 kips. Which is tension. FBD, that's a really bad D. That look, looks like DD. 4.167 kips, which is tension. So BD, 4.167 kips, which is tension. Now, we, we now have all of our forces, so we could quit here, but I think I'll go one extra step and check my forces, and I can do that by using one of the joints that I haven't used before. And I'm going to look at joint uh, D here, the middle joint, the one that I expressly avoided because it has so many, originally had so many unknowns, it had four unknowns, but it would, so it's not a very uh, good for, uh, joint to choose when uh, solving for unknowns, but as a check, it's a fantastic uh, way to check because it's a fantastic tool for checking because it'll only work, it'll only get, you'll, you can check to see if everything is in equilibrium there. And if everything comes to zero, then you know you got things right. So I'm going to do that. I'm going to check via D here. Oh, okay. I lost out a bit there. Okay, let me go back here. Okay. I'm going to check work via joint D. So I'm going to have joint D here. And instead of solving for an unknown force, I'm just going to do a sum of forces in the horizontal and vertical direction and see if everything indeed comes to zero. And I'm just going to go ahead and draw everything as tension, like as I have been doing. And then I'll put in known values. This is, this is 3, 4, 5, 3, 4, and 5, 3, 4, and 5. And this is FCD, F, uh, this is FDE, uh, this is FBD, and this is FAD. And the known values of these, this is 4.167 kips, This is negative 4.167 kips. In other words, this is actually in compression. This FCD is actually indeed in tension, and it is to equal to 10 kips. Carries a force equal to 10 kips. And FDE is also in tension, uh, carrying a tension, equal, tension force 
equal to 3.333 kips. Okay. So I'll go ahead and keep using orange for a con to be consistent. Because why not? So I'll first do a sum of forces in the vertical direction, just because I think that's going to be a little simpler. And I could write out, uh, let's see, FAD times 3 over 5 uh, plus FBD times 3 over 5. And this should equal 0. And then if I substitute in my known values, this would be 4.167 times 3 over 5, or my negative 4.167 times 3 over 5, plus the BD, FBD, the positive 4.167, times 3 over 5 equals 0, or it should equal 0 anyway. And this is negative 4. Point, it's the same thing, equal and opposite, negative 4.167 and positive 4.167, both multiplied by 3 over 5. So this will clearly come to 0 equals 0. So we are good in terms of equilibrium in the vertical direction. I'm going to do the horizontal one down here because we need a little extra room. Uh, sum of forces in the x direction. I will have negative FCD uh, and then plus FDE. Then um, minus FAD times 4 over 5 uh, plus FBD this might be there, also times 4 over 5. Also times 4 over 5. Okay, so uh, FCD, let's see, so this is then negative 10 kips. My FDE will be plus 3.33 kips, or 3.33 kips, uh, minus FAD. Now, this is minus uh, AD here. AD is equal to negative 4.167 kips, so it's a double negative, negative 4.167 kips. It's a really bad 61167. Uh, times my 4 over 5. And BD will be plus 4.167, if I cannot uh, trip over my tongue. Also times 4 over 5. And then this should, of course, come equal to 0. So this will be negative 10 kips and plus 3.33. And if you multiply that out, you'll see that this comes to 3.333, repeating, and that same one there, 3.333 kips, all this should come equal to zero. And what do you know? Negative 10 plus 10, 3.333 times 3, uh, that is 10 should equal to zero, and zero is indeed equal to zero, so we are good. Um, sum of forces y does equal to zero on this joint, and sum of forces uh, in the x direction also equals to zero at this joint. So we now know that we have equilibrium on this joint in both the x and the y direction, and this served as a final check to make sure that we had all our forces in the right direction, all of our magnitudes correct, and it checks out, so we are good. And that is the basic idea, the basic principle of the method of joints. So method of joints, if you're trying to solve for every force and every member, it can get quite tedious, as you can probably imagine. If you're, if you're working through this, you'll see that. And it can take a while, but uh, it is a traditional method of solving for trusses. Uh, it's more useful, I think, uh, to, as a matrix method, and we will be taking a look at that uh, in another video. Okay, all right, that'll do it for now. Thank you for watching, and as always, thank you.